Hello, and welcome to episode one of the Physique Development Podcast. This show is a question and answer based show where we take questions we have been asked by our listeners and answer them through our industry experience as coaches and from our professional perspectives. Today, we'll be discussing three commonly asked questions and topics. Number one, female muscle growth. This topic will be led by Coach Alex. Number two, how to create good habits and stick to them, led by Coach Sue. And third, how to design at-home training programs, led by myself, Coach Austin. What you can expect from today's podcast is for each topic or question to be put on the clock for about 15 to 20 minutes. The coach leading the topic or question will start the discussion. This will then be followed up by other coaches weighing in with their thoughts and experience. It is our goal not only to supply you, the listener, with valuable insights on the topic or question, but also to plant some seeds for further research and thought. Without further ado, let's get into topic number one, female muscle growth. Alex, from your experience working with female physique athletes and a large base of female lifestyle clients over the years, what would you say are the keys to growing muscle as a female? There is a, a plethora. And I think that the, the easy way and things that many of you have heard are going to be eat in a surplus and train hard. And that is both very true, but we want to dig a little bit deeper and give you more insight into what we see at physique development and be very successful, whether that be with lifestyle clients or with physique competitors specifically. So training wise, moving away from the the hit based uh, training sessions that you may experience within Orange Theory or just chasing the the burn or the sweat. We want to get under heavy loads within your training. We want to follow periodized training that allows for you to progress within different movements as well as improving the execution of different movements that you are uh, utilizing through this growth phase. Um, wherever you want to build tissue, pick movements that you're very good at the execution or movements that you're wanting to get very good at and um, see progression uh, on those movements and continue to facilitate strength through those. Um, but the, the main thing to take away with training is to be uh, on a program that is going to last, not going through and, and following Instagram swipe workouts or anything of that nature uh, that may seem appealing and exciting, but in reality are not influencing your progress to the upteenth degree. Nutrition and cardio. Uh, within nutrition, I think that it is important to understand that you need to track not only in a dieting phase, but also in a maintenance or a surplus phase to ensure the greatest degree of growth is going to transpire. Many athletes, many lifestyle clients that, that do come to us that they state they've been in a, a surplus or a maintenance. And the reality is, is that they've just never tracked outside of the dieting phase. So being consistent within your tracking is going to be an important piece of the puzzle. Um, keeping in cardio is actually something that I think many are surprised by uh, within physique development that we want to do to keep in. Uh, this is going to benefit for a handful of reasons. It's going to help with digestion. It is going to help with overall mental health, getting outside, getting steps in, uh, and allowing for us to keep the caloric intake a little bit higher. Um, so those are the, the first three pieces. And I have a, a couple of other points here, but I think that I would like for both of the coaches, uh, here to weigh in as well and, and give any of their thoughts at this point. Yeah. So I love that Alex mentioned cardio as that's something clients are always surprised to hear that we try to keep in. And a huge reason for that, he mentioned a few of them there. And not only digestion, but for nutrient uptake and being able to truly absorb those nutrients. Um, and it's something as far as when you are eating at either a surplus or at maintenance, a lot of times people will end up feeling sluggish because when they diet, they might feel light on their feet or feel more athletic. And so being able to think about your health as a whole, we're not just looking at pure aesthetic here. And the way that we optimize growth is optimizing how your body works. And so making sure that you're putting in the variables that are going to allow your body to be working at top notch is going to be there. So cardiovascular health is an extremely important part. And people just look at cardio and they're like, cardio sucks. I don't want to do cardio. Or they look at it as like, it's a means to an end. I only do it when dieting. But being able to find cardio forms outside of dieting that you really enjoy. So it doesn't have to be 
uh, cut and dry as far as I'm going to be on the Stairmaster for this amount of time, or I'm going to be doing uh, battle ropes for this amount of time. Maybe during a prep or during a deficit, you do track that a little bit closer. But for me, it's a huge thing as far as getting steps in, making sure that I'm doing things that I enjoy moving my body because the strictness within a dieting phase is there for a time and place, but it allows me to have some more flexibility outside of it. So whether it's going on a walk with my friend and not worrying about, oh, my heart rate is at a certain beats per minute or being able to go and do, uh, there's a fun place here called Activate Games where you can go and do all these like laser courses and stuff. And that would be a form of moving your body and being able to get in some activity without looking at it as like, oh, my coach still prescribes cardio. I'm still doing this. Why am I doing this when it comes to muscle growth? And some other great points that I'm just going to like really zone in on that Alex make is being able to make sure you're spending time eating in a fashion to support your training and growth. Um, so not constantly dieting on low calories, not constantly competing show after show. Um, it's something that being able to make sure that your body again is functioning at peak performance is going to be the best when it comes to being able to diet efficiently. It comes to being able to take time away from dieting. And so you need to get efficient at building muscle and being able to showcase that the next time that you go into your diet. Diet. We live in a very diet centric society. And so being able to look at muscle growth and not look at it as, oh, it's time to get fat, but it is a time to um, really hone in on some different goals that you're going after. Um, and another thing when it comes to muscle building, that's really, really helpful, especially for females is being able to set goals, which we are going to be talking about or creating habits that are going to be sustainable later in this podcast. But it's something that people kind of get lost because within dieting, it's very easy to see results. In 10, 12 weeks time, you can see some pretty crazy results. But when it comes to muscle building, it's not always the case and it can be very discouraging. So setting goals along the way to make sure that you're getting to that goal goal building, which I see firsthand from Austin and Alex and then myself, because I, <laughs> I know how I coach as well, but being able to set up each client and make sure, okay, what's our goal moving forward? Do we have strength goals that we're going after? Do we have um, performance goals that we're going after? And being able to set those goals along the way, because muscle building does take a longer amount of time. And if you do have those goals, it's going to make it a lot more efficient and set you up for a lot more success. Yeah. Great points by you both. And, um, you know, I'm going to kind of extract a few points. I made some notes here. Uh, so the first one I want to kind of touch on here is a point that Alex, um, some points that Alex made. And it's not just about what you're doing, but also how you're doing it, right? So exercises are great. Um, we know exercises to sort of train certain muscle groups. Um, you know, like this, we know the squat trains the quads and the glutes and, and stuff like that. Um but that only goes so far, right? So I'll repeat, it's not just what you're doing, but how you're doing it, right? So you could have a textbook program with all the right movements in there. And albeit, so this is why we talk about techniques so much, right? So if you go to our Instagrams, if you go to our YouTube channel, we're always talking about execution. We're always talking about technique. And it's because it's such a cornerstone of creating tension. And it's such a cornerstone of the goal, especially if you're looking to build strength, build muscle. And both of those also feed into your ability to lose body fat to the degree of keeping strength and keeping muscle during the process, right? So that's why technique and exercise execution is the cornerstone of kind of what we do. And really any client we get in, whether that's a physique competitor or a lifestyle client, we're always trying to adjust, um, we're always trying to address that cornerstone, right? What is that elephant in the room? And if we're not, we can have everything right on paper, but if we're not doing it the way we need to be doing it, and we're not executing those movements the way we need to, and placing a significant amount of tension on those kind of those target tissues, we can't expect our true goal to sort of come to fruition, especially as efficiently as it could have right? So we need to ensure the stimulus is sufficient on a given muscle, right? So ensure that stimulus or that stress that we're trying to put on those target tissues is sufficient. Um, and so I think one technique um, I know I, I like to use is, you know, if you're new to training or if you're new to kind of really paying attention to this stuff, choosing movements with less, you know, task failure, right? So if you don't have a coach or you're a coach yourself, 
um, or you're just looking to address some of these issues, maybe if you're trying to grow your quads or you're trying to grow your glutes, maybe we kind of break these down. Um, and as we work on our squat technique, for example, we also sort of implement some other movements that are a little bit more single joint or isolation based to get a little bit more volume specifically to those muscle groups, right? So we're not relying as heavily on like a squat, for example, to really stimulate our quads and our glutes. We work on that technique. We work on mastering that movement pattern, but we also start to implement um, while we're doing that, some other stuff to kind of assist with some volume work in the process. And so these are just some tactics. And that's, that's one thing I want to kind of to extract there. Um, and then one thing they both touched on was sort of the concept of keeping a high energy flux. So always keeping in mind, um, we're usually pretty aware with uh, calories in, and we're usually pretty aware with the concept of calories out. Uh, but Put in, I'll put it in this context. If our goal isn't to move the least amount possible so we can eat less calories, right? Or to eat as little as we can and then move as little as we can, right? We're built to move. We're built to be active people. We're built to be active. So keeping a high energy flux, right? So that's the more we're able to output productively without being in excess, the more we're going to be able to eat. So that's something to keep in mind, right? So keeping a high energy flux. So when we talk about um, like NEAT, for example, non-exercise activity thermogenesis, or basically non-exercise related movement, it's really so we can up that movement as we all are more sedentary with our jobs. And it's not just about steps. Um, steps have become very popular and steps are just a really easy way to sort of manage if you're not really sure how much you move throughout the day. Um, but also like getting a standing desk is a great way to kind of get more movement, cleaning your house, cooking, all of these fidgeting, like all of that is movement. Um, and steps are just a good way to sort of balance the equation and counteract that, especially like when you're in a dieting phase, because your body sort of adapts and responds itself and naturally to move less to conserve energy. So it's sort of a subconscious behavior. And so with steps, that's why that's kind of popular is with steps, you can just, well, I know I at least need to get 10,000 steps today um, because I know when I'm sitting at my desk, I'm not going to fidget anymore because I don't, I'm not in an excess of calories any longer, right? So the deeper you get into your deficits, um, the deeper you kind of get into these fat loss phases, the more intentional the movement needs to get. And getting steps is pretty intentional. Um, and the last few things I'll touch on here is kind of just breaking the cycle, um, like Sue touched on, kind of trying to break the cycle of the cut and bulk uh, mentality and, and understand that maintenance is very productive. Um, and that doesn't mean you're not in a, a, a muscle growth phase or something. Like if your goal is to build muscle or strength or both, you can do so while at maintenance or just slightly above, right? We don't need to be in this excessive, depending, I mean, each individual is slightly different, and that's something that we would address, but um, or you could address on your own or with your clients. But I think getting it's healthy to sort of get out of these cycles of well, I'm either cutting or I'm bulking, right? So understanding that there are times to to think about fat loss phases or cutting or or bulking or, or building muscle, but understand that also maintenance can be very productive. Um, so. Don't for kind of don't forget about that middle puzzle piece there that is absolutely a part of the equation and it can help you kind of stand the test of time long term. Um, and the last thing is just health. If you're in a muscle growth built, you know, a muscle growth phase, if you're in a if you're around maintenance or in a, even in a surplus in this regard, um, and this is even more um, important if we're in a deficit because as calories goes down. The amount of food variety we typically have, the amount of chances we get to hit the target go down. So health is very, very important. Getting in your micronutrients, your vitamins, your minerals, um, especially when we're in a surplus, right? So this is kind of where a dirty and clean bulk, or if you think about that, or, or keeping it clean or keeping, you know, whatever it is, there's going to be times, depending on who you are, you may just have to eat more, um, but also understand that fruits and veggies are still 
an asset. Um, and all of those foods that we see as like really nutrient dense still need to make up a majority of our calories the best we possibly can. So keeping health kind of at the utmost um, importance within that hierarchy during, even during a muscle growth phase. And Alex, you said you had a few more you wanted to touch on. Do we cover them all or do you have? A few no, left? I still have, I still have my, my final two. And, um, these are probably going to be the most important of the two points that I'll make. And, and the, and the first being overall hormonal health, uh, ensuring that everything from a, a sex hormone production as well as thyroid function are in an optimal place. Many of the clients that come to work with us uh, may not have had a, a, a cycle for uh, an extended period of time. So we are working to restore their hormonal health or restore their cycle in that uh, growth phase. And if you're able to restore sex hormone production, your likelihood of adding more muscle tissue is going to be extremely elevated. So making that the forefront of your uh, concerns and, and your goals um, is going to be uh, immensely helpful. And uh, when we look at, at thyroid production, uh, this is going to be something where if someone's chronically dieting, we're going to see some downregulation in thyroid function. And so getting labs and, and getting to look at the specific numbers is going to be immensely helpful for you uh, because you could be you know starting a race with two flat tires, essentially. And we want to get there. We want to be a well-oiled machine. We want to have the gas tank full. All the tires are in well-inflated state. And uh, we're, we're riding in a Corvette on our way to more muscle tissue. Um, the other thing and the last thing that I'll touch on is, is mental health. Uh, mental health is going to be a massive driving portion of you being able to sustain this period of time because this is not going to be a quick 10 to 12 week uh, process. This is going to be months on, on end and uh, not allowing for yourself to get caught up in Instagram where Becky and your, your friend Tanya are both in a dieting phase and they're shredded and you're like, damn, I wish I was shredded. And you get caught up in the fact of like, well, I should probably do that because right now, instantaneously, I want to also be in their shoes. Um, and so scrolling less on Instagram is going to be helpful. Doing the the self-care things are, are going to be important as well. Just maximizing your overall mental health is going to be important. And then understanding that uh, bad body image days are going to be a, a part of the entire experience. No one is going to have a hundred percent score on their positive body image day in and day out, whether they're dieting, whether they're in a surplus, any of the options. And so rolling with the punches, understanding that there's going to be ebbs and flows to it and sticking to your ultimate goal is going to be important. Yeah, I can definitely concur on not a hundred percent body image days. Uh, one last thing I, I want Alex to touch on just, I was going to ask you about comparison because I know you have a lot of athletes that are on Instagram that are looking at what other people are doing, or even just watch what you post of other competitors or other clients and just want to achieve the same results. But what would you say as far as supplements for muscle building, um, not talking about PEDs or anything of that, but just for general health to be able to optimize it, what would you say are things that you would recommend for clients or anyone listening? The, the base things I would say is that um, maximizing just your internal health, Austin spoke on uh, vitamins and minerals being a big piece. So if you feel as though your veggie and fruit consumption is low, getting in a, a greens product, getting in a, a multivitamin is going to be your base there um, to make sure that internal function is, is maximized. Then from there, I think that creatine would be immensely beneficial for uh, women specifically. Three to five grams of creatine monohydrate is going to... Um, uh, do the trick for you on that front. And then just having adequate protein consumption uh, is going to be a big piece. So having a protein powder may be helpful for you uh, in, in the long run. Um, and then potentially something that we supplement with, uh, with many clients is that uh, a sleep product will probably be even a greater assistance to your overall muscle growth as we all lead very stressful, very busy lives and being able to wind down at the end of the night and maximize having, you know, an immense amount of sleep is going to be a big driver for all individuals listening as well as physique development athletes. Yeah. Train hard, recover harder for the growth. There comes. you go. <laughs> There you go. Um, so any other any other things we want to touch on there? I think we're I think we hit that pretty well. Yeah, I thought that was good. Yeah, I'm good with it. Awesome. So we'll lead into question number two, topic number two. 
And so, Sue, with someone as productive as yourself, uh, it's key that you create good habits, learn how to stick to them. And so what's your advice on creating good habits and ensuring that you actually stick to them? Yeah. So when it comes to habits and goals, it's they kind of go hand in hand. So I'm going to talk a little bit about creating habits, talk about some tips that are going to be helpful for creating the habits and making sure that you stick to them. Um, and then kind of talk about how you can set your habits as well as setting goal setting, doing goal setting together, <laughs> hand in hand. So when it comes to habits, um, many people just want to change. So you might be able to think when I first said habits of like, oh my gosh, I want to stop biting my fingernails, or I want to get in a better habit of drinking more water, or I want to get in a better habit of going to sleep earlier. Those might have all popped into your mind. And I want you to write those down, first of all, so you know which habits you want to go after. Um, but you may want to change the way you look, the way you train, your knowledge, anything like that. Um, so with change comes that change in habits. So habits Habits are an extremely interesting thing. It's often stated that repetition causes habit formation. So you might see like, oh, it takes 21 days to form a habit or 33 days or 66. I've seen all of those numbers thrown around as far as habit creation. Um, but actually, there's a good chunk of research showing that while there is a connection or correlation uh, between habits and repetition, repetition doesn't inherently cause habits to form. It's emotion. Um, so if your brain associates a positive feeling, your brain takes notice. So that made me feel good. I want to do it again. Um, and that will help you to remember to do it again. And that will help you to form that habit. Now, while that all sounds Sounds very good and dandy. You might think, well, if it was that easy and if I felt good doing it, then I would have a lot more habits under my belt. So you might say like, oh, I enjoy working out. It made me feel good, but I don't do it all the time. Or I know that I should drink more water or get more sleep, but I still don't do it all the time. Um, so that's where another part of this comes in. Um, and it comes down to the mistake of not celebrating yourself enough. So when you make a small mistake, you almost always feel bad about it. I know I am my absolute worst critic. Um, I could sit and just completely trash myself. And sometimes I have to have Alex reel me back in um, if I make a mistake because I will just feel awful about it because I expect perfection out of myself, which I, I basically am perfect. So I I, I should expect perfection out of myself, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> when you accomplish a small goal, you almost never feel good about it. So it's something that um, there's a huge discrepancy there. When you do something small that's wrong, you beat yourself up about it. But when you do something small that's right, you just kind of move on. So we're very fast to punish ourselves um, for a bad performance, yet we're very slow to celebrate a good performance. So this can not only decrease our motivation, it also makes it much harder to achieve long-term goals because we just keep picking at ourselves. If you're like, I, another day where I didn't hit my water goal, and then that's going to add on to how you feel about yourself, and it's going to be very hard to pick that goal up. So getting back to that emotion standpoint, standpoint there was a study done by the Harvard Business School, um, and it showed that by tracking small achievements each day, workers had enhanced motivation. So that means by recording or celebrating our progress, it can boost your sense of confidence um, that can be levered towards those future larger successes. So that that dopamine can be released in these instances, which can energize us and give us that feel good emotion and not only be a feeling of reward or accomplishment, but it can also encourage you to take action and do what triggered that release of dopamine in the first place. So creating that addiction to progress. Um, so you might feel silly celebrating something small. I definitely do sometimes. Um, but the thing is, you're not celebrating because you made a huge achievement. It's not like, oh, I drank water before I drank coffee. I am the absolute best and everyone should bow down to me. It's more so that you're celebrating uh, because you were successfully changing your habits. And the big achievements that you actually want to reach, those will come as a result of those daily tiny actions in the right direction. So when it comes to um, finding a habit, one of my favorite things to do is to clump habits. Um, another way that I've heard it said is to kind of um, find what that trigger is for doing that habit. So I have clients that often will say that they have a hard time remembering to take their supplements. And that used to be Alex and I to a T. Um, and I would just go the whole day and be like, oh crap, I forgot to take all those supplements. Um, but I clumped it with a habit that I'm already doing. I'm already making breakfast each morning. And so whenever I make my breakfast and it's on the stove, that's when I pull out first a little bowl so that I'm not just like holding all of my supplements in my hand or I had a really bad habit habit of putting it in my pocket and then forgetting about it. And then I would go on up 
throughout my day and either wash them in my clothes, and I've ruined some clothes from that, um, or I would then reach into my pocket at night and be like, oh, there's everything I was supposed to take today. So uh, being able to have that in front of my face, because I know if it's sitting in front of me, I will much more likely to do it than if it's in my pocket because I get carried away. My brain's going in a million different directions. But it's also something that each time I'm cooking, I'm like, oh, wait, I haven't taken my supplements yet. I'm going to go ahead and find the small bowl, put everything into the bowl, and then move on um, and take those throughout my breakfast. So it's something that I was constantly forgetting, but being able to first not only solve a problem to holding it in my hand or putting it in my pocket or then rolling over the counter, but clumping it with a habit that I'm always going to do. So um, again, with the water and the coffee, if you might be like, oh, I always drink coffee before I have water, making sure as your coffee is brewing, as you put in the Nespresso pot, if you put in the K cup, whatever it may be, that you're also filling up your water cup. And then as that's brewing, making it a habit of sitting there and drinking some water. So being able to clump your habits um, or find what that trigger is to remember that habit is going to be extremely helpful. Another one is just to be starting simple. Oftentimes people come to this point of like, I want to change everything in my life. And that's something with clients where they're like, I want to make this huge change. And it's like, that's awesome. But is doing a 180 degree change sustainable? And is it going to be something that you can actually implement? So instead, it's taking one step forward um, and putting one foot in front of the other. So not taking on too much. Um, And it's even something like, let's say you're like, I want to go to sleep earlier. And let's say you say you want to go to sleep two hours earlier the first night you try going to sleep two hours earlier is going to be extremely difficult. It's going to feel like you are, I mean, grandma gearing up for bed, Um, but being able to start, okay, I'm going to start 30 minutes earlier tonight. All right. And two more nights, I'm going to do 30 minutes earlier than that. And then being able to get into that habit a little bit slower and a little bit simpler. So you're not taking on this huge task and eating this big chunk out of your day. Um, Another thing is being able to remind yourself. So being able to place uh, reminders throughout your house or wherever they may be, um, but also what the purpose of the habit was to begin with. So let's say it was drinking water. The purpose was to be able to feel better, to be able to hydrate yourself and be able to have better uh, reach towards your goals for your health and fitness um, aesthetics and your performance. Uh, So being able to remind yourself, it's not just, oh, I didn't get my water in today. It's I am putting myself in a place where I'm not reaching my overall goal. Um, And being able to have that as a reminder is extremely, extremely helpful. Um, Or even just having like a calendar and marking off each day. I'm someone who really thrives off of being able to like check things off a list. If I have like a whole list of things to do in a day and I don't get to check any of them off the list, my day kind of feels incomplete. Um, So making a list not only helps within doing the habit, but then it's also that reminder of like, oh, I got it done. And that's like a a small dopamine hit for me as I cross something off my checklist. Um, And then also being able to have a buddy is helpful, a buddy or a coach, someone to hold you accountable. And especially if your friend or buddy wants to be able to do that as well. So you can always text each other, hey, did you hit your water goal today? Did you make sure that you drank this much water throughout the day, whatever it may be. Um, And one really, really important one is to replace a lost need. So this is something where people go into a habit and they try to change their habit and then they don't replace what they're giving up. So let's say that you want to stop watching TV, but watching TV was the only time during the day that you had to relax. Then you completely cut that out from you. And then that's going to be really hard to form that habit because you haven't replaced that need. Now it's not replacing one habit with a maybe less habit worse habit, but replacing the need of the habit. Um, So if you're taking away TV and TV was a time for you to wind down or zone out, how can you now do that? Is that through yoga? Is that through going on a walk and listening to a podcast? Is that through meditating? Whatever that may be, being able to replace what that need is. Um, And then when it comes to habits, knowing what the benefit is, which I kind of already talked about, but knowing what the pain is as far as if you don't reach that goal, what are the negatives for not reaching that goal? What are the consequences and the downsides of that? So those are just some things within habit formation when it comes down to it of being able to get in on your goals and what those are going to be. But a huge part within habits, which you might have already kind of 
gathered from me talking is when it comes to being able to set things that are actually going to be attainable. So SMART goal setting, SMART in all caps, um, is going to be very helpful for habit setting and goal setting. So when it comes to what SMART stands for, it's going to stand for specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, and timely. So when it comes to specific, making sure it's not just, oh, I want to feel better because you can't really measure that on a metric. It's not specific. You don't know. And so then you get in this loop of never achieving your goals and always feeling like you're not achieving your goals, which is no fun. Um, So being able to kind of ask yourself, um, what exactly do I want to achieve? Where, how, when, with whom? What are the conditions? What are the limitations? Uh, What exactly do I want to reach this goal for? What are possible alternative ways of achieving the same thing? So it's not just, I want to look good. It's, I want to meal prep all of my meals for the next week on Sunday night to be successful for the upcoming uh, week to make sure that I feel good. So it's not just that one that's not specific and it's just, oh, I want to feel good because how are you going to know when you feel that way? Um, Another one is measurable, like I said. So making sure exactly, being able to identify exactly it is what you will see, hear, or feel when you do reach your goal. And being happier is not evidence of that because you can't always measure happiness. So making sure that you have that measurable goal is going to be great for being able to measure it along the way and know that you're headed towards the right path. Um, It's the same thing with doing check-ins with a coach. You're taking time to measure how you're going about. Um, Keeping a logbook, you're taking time to measure how you're progressing within training. Um, Being able to have those measurable goals will make them actually something that you can reach because you can measure if you got there or not. Um, And that loops into attainable. And if it's something that is going to be a reality for you, um, if you weigh the effort, the time, the costs of the goal, and what that looks like, and if it can be a priority in your life. Um, Also, if it is relevant. So the main thing you want to ask is why do you want to reach this goal? And what's the objective behind this goal? And will this goal really achieve that objective? And then when it comes to being timely, um, one thing within being timely is if you're too strong, stringent on that. Sometimes it can be very discouraging, but being able to set that goal of a checkpoint time, I think is a lot more realistic and a lot more motivating because it gives you that time to check in, see what you need to shift within your goals, um, and then be able to move forward. So when it comes to habit formation, uh, just to wrap up a few things that I said is just being able to realize that it is the emotion part of it as well as time and being consistent with it, but being able to have those different steps that I mentioned along the way can really help with them getting those habits formed um, and not doing that all or nothing approach. So that's what I have as far as goal setting, habit formation, um, and what that looks like. So either of you guys can take it away for what else you want to add. I know I talked a lot and fast, but <laughs> that'll be a no, theme. It's great. <laughs> that's great. I'll, I'll go really quick. Um, so a lot of great points made there. Uh, I just want to kind of touch on a few of them that you, a few of them that have been really important for me. Um, kind of over the years of just creating better habits. I wouldn't say I'm, I'm the, uh, the kingpin of, of great overall, like efficiency of life. Um, but I also don't think it's, I think it's important that we don't get too caught up in sort of judging our best self on the amount we accomplish each day or how productive we were or, or whatever else. Right. So, um, that's just kind of my, my own thing um, and, and really managing your expectations there uh, and just setting things up kind of from the jump a little bit better um, to kind of better achieve those things. But the first thing I wanted to mention that's been really, really helpful for me um, kind of in the, the camp of managing expectations is success lies in the metrics you're tracking, right? So this is kind of that those smart goals. Um, if we're going towards a certain thing yet you're grading yourself on something else, how do you expect yourself to get there? Um, how, how is that a fair assessment of what you've been working on, right? So understand success lies in the metrics you're tracking. So you need to set those metrics. And that's kind of what Sue was talking about with SMART goals. We need to create something that is smart. We need to create intelligent goals. We need to create, um, we need to create timely goals, things we can manage and assess over time, right? Um, another thing that has really helped me out is association triggers. So I know, um, like I can't, I can't eat and lounge in bed because by the time it goes, it's time to go to bed, I will now associate that with lounging or eating or 
whatever else. And now um, I'll have trouble going to sleep. Same like with my work day. Um, so working on like professional goals. I know when I get to my desk, uh, I have a certain place I put my phone. And the first thing I do is now that I have my standing desk, hallelujah, I basically raise up my standing desk first thing in the morning, I put my phone uh, in the place it goes, and I'm off and running into email. And so it's those association triggers. And I know once I take steps away from my desk or I take like a work break or um, I know I this is my time to like post on social media or, hey, here's five minutes to kind of catch up with DMs or just sort of, I hate to say reward yourself with social media, but I mean, hey, if you enjoy and you... I think if you've cultivated an enjoy, um, enjoyful, that's not a word. Um, if you've created and sort of cultivated this really, really cool community within social media and you follow people, you really enjoy looking at their content, you learn a lot, it's a good experience. Who's to say that's a negative thing, right? So, um, you know, a lot of, for me, that's, that's how I'm keep up with friends or that's how I keep up with certain things happening within the industry or within a certain, um, a certain space and I learn a lot. So making sure those association triggers are in check um, and understanding that those things happen. And some I think are more sensitive than others. I'm someone who's very sensitive with association. Um, and so I very much have those cues and triggers that I have to sort of watch out for. Um, the next one uh, is self-compassion. How would you treat a friend in the same situation? That's how you should be treating yourself in this in this situation and I, this has been something that's really um i've had conversations with clients in the in the past and this is something that i think we all could improve upon right so if you're dealing with something and if let's say you're just struggling with that thing or that situation imagine yourself having a friend a close friend or just anyone come to you and tell you the exact same situation that you're in right now how would you address that? How would you handle that? How would you speak to that friend, right? You'd probably give them more compassion than you're giving yourself. You would not be as hard on your friend as you are being on yourself, right? And there's a lot of, if you really sort of address that in that manner, you sort of can, you almost steel man the argument in a way where you are seeing the holes within your own argument and making that essentially making that stronger for yourself, which then is going to help you more easily deal with that pain, deal with that stress, or deal with that sort of acute anxiety, right? So anxiety isn't, acute anxiety, it just is a, is a marker, it's a trigger, it's telling us something is wrong, right? Um, now, not addressing that issue, not addressing that anxiety can prolong that, and now it becomes chronic, now it becomes something that we're dealing with day in and day out because we haven't addressed it, right? We haven't properly dealt with it. Um, and so I think in, in large part, a lot of these, especially for me through experience, can get better with self-compassion and treating yourself as if your friend was going through it. How would you give them advice? Um, and at the end of the day, I think we'd all be better off if we listened to our own advice. So that's where I want to end that one. Alex, what do you got? I will just add one more in the sense that uh, with like to-do list or, or task list within habits, um, I am someone who has all of the confidence in the world that I'm going to crush the world after about my first three or four sips of coffee. I have, I've, I've had a good night of sleep. I'm up very early and it's like, okay, well, this to-do list is going to be about 18 things long. And at two o'clock hits and I've got about six things done and I'm tired and there's, and then I'm looking at the day as kind of a failure. Thus, I encourage you to uh, set realistic goals within your, your day-to-day -day task to ensure that you're not just leaving yourself feeling empty handed at the end of the day, because you didn't finish this post-it note that has a million things scribbled on it, that it was impossible to even get done in the, the time awake, let alone maybe in a week time. Uh, so that would be the, the one thing I'll add there. Yeah. And talking about that realistic thing, um, as far as like how many tasks you can get done in a day, uh, I was just talking about this to someone the other day, as far as timing yourself to tasks. So you know, what's truly attainable because I 
used to be the person that would put a million things on my task list. And every day I'd be like, man, I suck. Like this is not getting done. Um, and then Alex went through a period of time where he was like, I'm, I just, I'm not being productive. I'm lazy. And I'm like, you've been working all day. What do you mean you're lazy? Um, and he'd be like, I still have this to get done. I was like, well, did you time yourself doing these tasks? Cause I, I recently did that. So I'm feeling like I can give advice on it. Um, did you time yourself and how long it took you to do that? And then it was like, oh wait, that's not realistic. I'm setting myself up for failure each day, thinking that I can uh, do these things. Um, and then getting very, beat down and feeling like I'm not reaching my goals. And then it gets into this negative feedback loop. So that's even something with clients. Like if clients are leaving each day, maybe they didn't hit their macros on the head, then they get into this negative feedback loop of, of, man, I suck. I'm not hitting my goals. And so it's being able to set them up. All right. How can we make it so that you're hitting your goals? Or how can we make your goals a little bit easier or more attainable for you to hit so that you can go into the night feeling good about yourself and wake up each morning knowing that you're going to crush everything that you have laid out for the day great points i think we hit i think we nailed that one (laughs) all right our third question austin as COVID has forced a lot of people into their home gyms what is a good way to set up an at-home training program right on so as i do um i overthought and i tried to prepare my best um sort of points to just give you some ways to just think about it. Um, so I didn't want to give stats and reps. Um, so this advice can be useful for yourself, um, considering these factors for your clients. Uh, but my, my ultimate goal over the next, hopefully 10 minutes or so. Um, so saddle up, take a drink, um, maybe pause, take a break if you need it, uh, is basically not to give you exact sets and reps, but to expand your lines of thought. Uh, So I want to potentially give you some new ways of considering these challenges we all face, right? So either for yourself or for your clients as coaches, this has been a interesting challenge. Um, I know as physique development, we've written hundreds of at-home programs and we were not that used to doing it beforehand. Um, I know I wasn't. Uh, And so now though, with some of these strategies, some of these things, some of these lines of thought um, that I'm going to kind of lay out for you. Uh, it's it's opened up a lot of possibilities and it's taken where I was otherwise really nervous and scared and because I, w- I was just attacking it in the same way that sort of again it go back it goes back to like managing expectations I was I was expecting us to just absolutely replicate what we were able to do in the gym have that much variety uh, etc all right so we're stuck at home um, whether you or your clients. Uh, I know in some states we we have gym access, but I know in others we we definitely don't, and and I don't know when that's going away, right? And there's absolutely some of my clients uh, that have chosen to stay home, right? So uh, even with limited equipment, they've chosen to stay home um, for their own, you know, for their own choices, right? So I think the first question we really need to answer here, and the first question we need to ask ourselves and or our clients is what is your setup? What's your situation? Like, what does it look like, right? So, you know, when people come into work with us, we're getting photos of your training space. We're getting inventory lists of what you have available, right? So do you have bands? Do you have access to dumbbells, barbells? Do you have a full-on home gym, you know, like the Bush household does, which is retrofitted with the the best um, and sufficient loads to basically accumulate volume and strength in any phase. So, um, which is an awesome situation to be in, right? But each one of these are challenges that we face in each one of these, whether it's yourself programming for yourself or programming for clients, right? Um, And so you're going to be, understand this, you're going to be limited by the equipment um, and access to resistance that's in front of you, right? So that's gonna limit you to some degree. Some are a lot less limited than others, but some are quite limited, right? So. If you're in the camp, uh, a low amount of weights or resistance available, so in the body weight, bands, you know, lighter dumbbells camp, I would encourage you to kind of choose a goal that best matches those resources, right? So have that conversation either with yourself or with your clients and set realistic expectations, right? This goes back to setting measurable, smart goals. Um, so we, 
we're not expecting to to move the world, right? When we we have little t- tools available to do so. All right, so this is going to keep you in a mindset of progression rather than regression, which I think is very very important, right? So if we need to choose goals, we need to choose our expectations wisely. That way, we're always sort of moving productively towards a mindset of progression rather than regression. Okay, so ultimately, we're trying to manage expectations for ourselves or for our clients. All right, so I'm going to kind of lay out. Um, again, there were so many ways I could have attacked this, um, but I'm going to lay out some things that I've been utilizing with clients. And I know we, as physical development, has been have been utilizing with clients who only have access to lighter resistance via dumbbells, body weight, or bands, all right? So first off, we've chosen a goal that matches the resistance we have available. I mentioned that. This isn't the time to focus on getting really, really strong. This is going to be a good time to sort of run through maybe some metabolic style work alongside some maintenance-focused work, right? So we know that to maintain a certain level of muscle tissue, right? This isn't to say you, you're not going to lose some strength. This isn't to say that you're not going to lose some muscle tissue in the short term. But we know that with a lower than you think amount of volume, as long as we're working at a certain uh, level of intensity and proximity to failure, we can hang on to a lot of adaptations more than you would think, right? So don't lose hope, don't lose faith. Um, but we need to be sure that we're setting our sights on something that's realistic and that's manageable. Keep your split higher frequency based, right? So if you only have access to uh, bands, body weight, or light dumbbells, we wanna keep that split higher frequency based, which means you're training muscle groups more often during the week, right? So instead of training, let's say chest once per week or glutes once per week, you're going to be training those like if you're training four days and you don't have that many you know you don't have that much load it may be smart that maybe all four days you get some glute work in there or chest work in there or maybe two out of those four right depending on how much resistance and how much volume you're sort of attributing to those days how long are those sessions um and and how hard are those sessions and how many what levels of variety um what tools of available do we have during those sessions okay so your training split in this situation um if it is higher frequency could be something like an upper lower with a rest and then upper lower and then a rest right so you don't always have to work off a seven day framework or a five day training week um you can just have a split that just sort of repeats itself um and so you know if you're not locked into needing to train only monday through fridays you can customize that, right? Or if you are, and you have a set number of days you can train, and when you you know when you can't train, then set your split accordingly to that, right? So a higher frequency, when I mean that, when I say higher frequency though, I just basically mean hitting those muscle groups more often. So that typically looks like an upper lower sp- split or something that we like to use is like an anterior posterior split, right? So training the front of the body one day, that includes upper and lower. And then the the second day, we train the posterior, the back, right? So back, um, hamstrings, glutes, calves, things like that, Uh, which has been, again, it can kind of change up the monotony of an upper lower split if you you want to do that. And also, you're you're able to stimulate more big muscle groups on consecutive days, right? So keeping us or allowing us to, to train bigger tissues more often. Um, which is going to be advantageous for us, um, especially just staying in shape, staying healthy, keeping those tissues stimulated um, accordingly. And uh, next point here, um, if you or your clients have limited time or simply can't endure the monotony, um, you can, again, bias more volume to larger muscle groups and larger movement patterns, right? So thinking like compound movements. Uh, multi-joint movements. This is going to train more muscle tissue overall per session compared to if I were to just do a session where I was like, okay, arm curls, lateral raises, um, things like that, right? So 
focusing more on like large movement patterns, hitting large amounts of tissue. Um, so in compound movements, doing those large movement patterns, you're always going to get overlapping volume on smaller muscle groups as they act as synergists or helpers to the larger muscle groups, right? So an example here is your biceps receiving some overlapping volume in something like a pull down or a row, um, or your glutes getting some volume alongside the quads and, and the calves are being kind of touched on in like a squat pattern, for example. Um, that's going to be sort of a good way to attack it uh, if you don't, if you're kind of just stuck and you're not sure. Think about it a little bit more broadly like that and you can sort of start to break things down. And this is where we start to disassociate movements with muscles, right? So we think of like, okay, well, it's leg day, so I have to bench or I have to do this or I have to do this or... Um, or it's chest day. Did I say leg day? It's chest day. Okay. Um, so if you want to bench on leg day, that's fine. Um, <laughs> um, but like I was basically trying to say, if it's leg day, you know, you think of legs, okay, I have to squat. Or you think of chest day, okay, I have to bench. Well, if you don't have very much equipment, you may not have that many options, right? So more or less thinking of like muscles we need to train rather than movements we need to train, right? So thinking more broadly can really open up a lot of variety for you, okay? Um, we also add th components outside of fitness or outside of, I mean, outside of the gym, right? So also adding components of fitness outside of the gym. Things like running, cycling, hiking, swimming, walking, um, what are some other things that we can really focus on that aren't like resistance training gym related? Um, and so during, again, however long this period of time is for you, right? So if you know, let's say you have an end in sight, like, okay, I know I'm spending th the next three months kind of at home. Um, and then I want to return back to the gym in three months, right? This is a great time to really focus on maintenance within your training. Um, doing the things that I kind of mentioned previously, and then also pairing that sort of think of like concurrent training where we're pairing something like an aerobic sort of based goal with a training based goal of sort of maintenance or, um, something of the same sort of response or adaptation than we, that we're trying to gain, um, from the aerobic work, but with resistance training, right? So, um, focusing on a goal outside of the gym is really, really good. And it's been really productive um, for a lot of people that we work with. Uh, again, things like running, cycling, hiking, swimming, walking, um, going kayaking, like whatever you're into. Um, but trying to keep something or trying to keep it fitness related or activity related, um, going towards a new goal, right? So, you know, Alex and Sue both mentioned um, within the female muscle growth portion that it's important to have goals outside of like directly building muscle, right? So having performance-based goals, strength-based goals, things like that, right? So this is a kind of under the same line of thought, um, but it exists within sort of like aerobic goals, which is going to benefit you long-term um, once you return back to the gym, right? Lastly here, I want to mention um, potentially just picking up a new hobby, right? So if you're normally training six days a week in the gym or five days a week or whatever it is, and you're now training three days a week because you, ha you do have limited equipment, um, whether you can only bear three days of training and or you really want to focus on, you have another goal, right? So you're doing three days of resistance training. Um, you have an aerobic base goal you're working on. Um, or you just have, you know, you're going to have more free time overall to do fun activities, right? So much room for activities. So we can potentially pick up a new hobby, right? So this can be fitness or non-fitness related. I would encourage everyone to have a non-fitness related hobby or non sort of related to your profession, right? So if we're speaking to trainers here, when you go around the room and someone asks you what your hobbies are and you say, and you're a personal trainer and you say, 
one of my hobbies is resistance training. We, that's not a really good answer. Like we need something outside of that, right? You need to be more well-rounded in that way and get yourself out of your profession. Get yourself out of what you do day in and day out. Um, and this can be in the form of a new hobby, right? So I do believe that fitness should be a, a large part of your life. Um, I do believe fitness is a very important puzzle piece um, throughout your life, but I don't think it's the sole focus or should be the sole focus of every aspect or every sort of chapter of your life, if that makes sense. Okay, so as long as we're keeping things in check, right? So we're getting a certain maintenance level of training if that's desired. Um, and then as long as we have nutrition, sleep, and stress management in check, and our mental health in check, half of what you're doing before um, is still gonna be productive within the gym or, or at your at-home workouts, and it's gonna keep you healthy. Okay, so picking whether that's, you know, whatever that is, playing the guitar, maybe starting to read more, um, picking up a different type of modality, like picking up yoga, um, whatever that is, right? But it needs to be, if you are a trainer, I would really encourage you to pick up something that is outside of your profession, something you do every single day, right? Challenge the mind in new ways. Um, the last thing, um, or one of the last things, I'm a liar, I am a liar. Um, one of the last things here, um, basically going to, uh, and I wanna have these guys weigh on this uh, after I mention it, because um, I know they ran into, as they were building out their home gym, they ran into uh, some things with having access to enough load, um, but it was very limited as far as the variety of the way the body was being loaded, right? So um, some of us have invested into squat racks, barbells, um, dumbbells, like free weights, right? And um, the volume utilizing only barbells and free weights, it's a bit different than the volume coming from the combination of like free weights, machines, cables, as you're probably used to training in the gym, right? It's just gonna hit a bit different. And there's some other things that you have to keep in mind. Okay, so this comes down to where, where in the range of motion, or where in that muscle, or the range of that muscle, range of motion of that muscle rather, sorry, where is that being most challenged, right? Where in the movement is that being most challenged? Alongside how that load is being received by your body. Right? So for example, in a leg press, your spine is not being loaded. In a back squat, it is. In a barbell lunge, it is. In something like an RDL, it is. But in like something like a seated leg curl, uh, lying, or lying leg curl, leg extension, your spine isn't gonna be as loaded. And it's gonna be challenging in a different part of that range of motion for your muscle, right? So it, it does matter and it does make a difference. And you're gonna know it does hit a bit different, right? You could equate volume but it's gonna feel different, right? So you have to be able to sort of pivot, understand, and sort of manage those variables a bit more. Um, so you can't simply go from all that volume maybe you're potentially doing in the gym with variable resistance with machines, free weights, and cables, and basically move all that over to only working with like free weights, so like barbells, and dumbbells, for example. So I know you guys kind of ran into those issues. Um, what was kind of your experience with that and how quickly did it hit different um, when you had to go straight barbell dumbbell work relative to like machine-based stuff and cable-based stuff? Yeah, I'll have Alex hit on that and then I have two, three other points I wanna hit on real quick. So. Um, well, when we first got the squat rack and the dumbbells in, um, I was, I mean, having a home gym is something that I've always wanted since I was a, a kid to begin with. So I was obsessed with just going out there and playing with it for the most part. Um, so for like the first couple of weeks, I was squatting every day. <laughs> 
or benching <laughs> randomly. Yeah, in the like of Corey the day. Gregory squat every yeah, day. Yeah, I literally was just so excited to have it out there that I would just go out there and bench or squat, and it was not a good habit for me to take a break from work and just go out there and do random exercises for thirty or forty five minutes and then come back in. And I was doing it two or three times a day, so um, that beat me up pretty quickly. Uh, but past that, an actual program design loading the spine as frequently as we were, we were pretty beat up and had to back off of the total volume as well as frequency as a whole, um, just because of just the the beat down and heavier loading that we hadn't had because we had been training with bands for, you know, a few months at that point or a month or so. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and it's something that a lot of people don't take into consideration of like, how much is my spine being loaded? And it was something that even if someone could do an exercise or work a muscle group with a barbell or a dumbbell or something like that, I would put in something else and they'd be like, well, I can do that with a barbell. Why am I not doing that? And it was talking about, all right, spinal health and putting yourself under that much load all the time is very, very hard on your body. So we had to deload a lot sooner than we expected. We had to take breaks a lot sooner than we expected expected. Um, we had to have less volume. Um, so just definitely something to keep in mind, but the few points that I'll say, as far as home training goes, it gives you a great time to focus on execution. It's very easy to get caught up in like grind all day. I'm going to hit PRs every time I step into the gym. And now that you don't have as much accessibility and you're working out in the comfort of your own home, you're not having to work, worry about how your workout is being perceived as others, which I feel like is a downfall for many people. Many people get themselves into a less than advantageous situation because they're training in front of people and they want to present themselves a certain way. And I have a hundred percent gotten looped into this. Let's say I'm doing a metabolic phase, so I'm not lifting as as heavy as I would in a neurological phase. And then someone walks in the gym and I start to feel inferior because, oh, I'm a female in the gym and they're judging me. And then I'm just going to put more weight on the bar. Um, but I didn't run into that because no one was watching me at home. Um, and it was something where I could film myself without having to worry about being embarrassed for filming myself um, and really get good at some execution for some different movements. So it gives you that time to get out of that gym mentality um, and be able to really hone in on your execution and nail that down. So when you do get back in the gym, you are good to go. Um, another thing here as being able, like Austin said, of finding a different hobby um, and finding different ways to move your body. I had clients even with the fires going on that couldn't even go outside to walk with the air quality. And I was like, what else do you like to do? Um, And one of them said dancing. So we found some dance videos for them to do and being able to move their body in that way. Um, And with that, I also really honed in on association, which Austin talked about this in forms of goal setting. And it's the same with a lot of aspects of your life. But Do not try and train if you can help it in a room that you don't want that association with. So I found clients coming into the point of, oh my gosh, I do not want to train. I'm so discouraged. And I'm like, where are you training? Be like, oh, in my bedroom or in my living room or wherever it may be. And I know that's like some spaces you just might not have enough space, but I always encourage clients to go outside. And that changed it big time for some of my clients if they had the availability to train in a garage or outside on a deck or just outside on the sidewalk because that didn't have the association. If I'm in my living room, I'm relaxing. I am trying to not do work. I am trying to calm down. And if I try to do weightlifting in my living room, I will never get into the right mentality. Um, So it's something that not trying to copy the gym verbatim, like Austin mentioned, um, but also being able to form a new association um, and maybe even keeping some of those same habits. Like I talked about within habit forming of like, I'm going to get my pre-workout. I'm putting on my gym clothes. I'm going to go do this thing instead of like, oh, it's just in my garage. Like who cares how I set myself up? Because those steps do matter. Um, And the last thing I'll touch on is that it gives you time time to focus on your health and focus on other aspects of fitness. So I had a lot of clients running into before everything got shut down of, oh, I'm always going out to eat or getting really wrapped up in the social aspect. And it gave them time to truly realize, all right, how do I actually like to eat? What serves me? What does food mean to me? Be able to try out new recipes that maybe you didn't have time for before, um, as well as to really hone in on being consistent. And so that was the main thing. If clients didn't have accessibility or they're really 
really worn down when it came to training, being able to look at it as far as, okay, let's not think about training right this second. Let's think about food and how we can get that in the absolute best spot. How can we fine tune your meal prepping? And a lot of clients got really good at meal prepping. So when it went back to normal life, if you want to call it that, um, they had new skills that they were able to take forward and be more efficient and be able to rock and roll in that aspect. So looking at it from multifaceted, so many people get into like, all right, here's my normal routine. And when your normal routine gets halted, you have to think outside the box and you have to challenge your separate ways of thinking. You might think every time I go in the gym, I lift as heavy as I freaking can. Well, now you can't go in the gym and now you can't lift as heavy as you can. So what is that new challenge going to tell you about yourself or about your goals? Or how can you use that to achieve your goals in a different way? What you got, Alex? That was all good. (laughs) I've got nothing to add. That was fantastic. Um, I'm excited for everybody to get back in the gym when they can. (laughs) Yeah. So I got a quick checklist really quick um, that I'll go through and um, that'll kind of end us out here. So I'm going to go over this checklist. We'll end with any thoughts that we may have um, based off this checklist that I think is rather complete. Obviously, it's going to have these checklists could be 10 pages long, but I want to keep it short, sweet, um, and on behalf of you trying to um, address alongside things that Alex mentioned and or Sue mentioned, um, these are some things that at least will check some boxes for you and maybe allow you to think a little differently about how you're approaching your home workouts, right? So number one on the list is we'll go back to what type of resistance do you have available? Right, so this is going to dictate the type of exercises possible um, for you, along with those exercises um, and how those are going to stress the body. Okay, so where are those most loaded? Do they load the spine? Um, all of those things, right? This will also dictate your training split, right? So the less resistance you have available, the more high frequency you should go, meaning you should train muscles, muscle groups more often in the week, most typically, right? This is going to be individual. Um, and this is more or less applicable to those with really light lows like body weight or, um, resistance bands or really light dumbbells or or things like that. Um, as you know, these guys mentioned, it's, it's important that, you know, if you do have a little heavier equipment, um, that volume is going to hit a bit different and you got to be ready for that. And you have to sort of pivot and adjust, uh, and to accommodate that sort of different type of resistance um, that your body's going to face, right? So um, the more load, the less frequency you may be able to train with. And the more frequently frequently, um, you may have to deload, for example. The second one on the list that I want to mention is how are you recovering from that training, right? So this this is going to dictate what progressions can be um, or what can, what progressions can be made and what regressions may need to take place, right? So if you started out a little too ambitious, um, you may need to regress in something, right? So whether that was a movement pattern or the amount of volume or the amount of density, so the amount of work done in a given amount of time, right? So maybe you need to lengthen your rest periods more than you originally thought. So um, a lot of at-home workout variations include, well, let's just do everything, but do it faster. Um, or do it with less rest. And depending on what you're using and how you're sort of stressing your body in that certain instance, you still may need some rest. It's okay to rest. Rest isn't, rest isn't something that works against us necessarily. Um, you just kind of have, it's going to depend on that goal. Um, and so just because you are training at home or just because you're in a different environment doesn't sort of negate the importance of appropriate rest. Okay. So depending on what resistance you have, the volume could impact you differently and depending on what you are using or what you're used to. Okay. The third one is going to be progressing loads or intensity through the weeks. So how to achieve progressive overload. Okay, so some quick notes here. Um, this has a wide range of possibilities. So you could increase reps, you could increase load if possible, you could change your tempo, you could progress a variation. So you could go from a... Um, a push-up where you are just a normal push-up to a push-up where your feet are elevated, right? So that's going to make you 
train or lift more of your body weight um, per rep, right? I think it's a difference of uh, push-ups are somewhere close to like 55% of your body weight or maybe close there. Um, but feet elevated on like a 12 inch box ramps that up to like 74%, 75% of your body weight, right? So that's a progression. Um, and that could be sort of a, a part of progressive overload in a, in a way. Okay, you could change your tempo. Okay, you could do longer eccentrics or more time spent where those reps are hardest, right? So um, if that's a, a squat, maybe you just kind of change your tempo a bit, maybe add a pause in that lengthened position, that bottom position. Um, and those are things that you would do kind of over the weeks. You could alter your rest time between sets, as I mentioned. You could go from straight sets to supersets. You could add more sets of a given exercise. Um, again, the options are vast here. All I will say is if you're going to make these progressions, do it one at a time and see how your body responds, right? So don't make every everything I said, don't do all that. Go from week one where you're normal and then go to week two where you just made all of those adjustments, right? Um, choose one or two and sort of stick with that. See how that does for you, how your body responds, how you recover, um, and how you're adapting over the weeks, right? Because these adaptations are not going to be instantaneous. Um, that doesn't change whether we're training at the gym or at home. And the last thing, the final thing I want to mention, um, or the second to last thing, <laughs> just lying today. The second to last thing, um, can you choose a goal outside of your resistance training to focus on? Okay, so adding an aerobic-based goal during this time, uh, working on your health, uh, as Sue said, uh, is a great thing, um, working on different aspects. But this can be a great idea and a way for you to even sort of be even better off when you're able to return back to the gym or back into your quote-unquote more normal routine. Lastly, is there a hobby that, you can, uh, that you've always wanted to try that you just haven't had time for? Okay, so this could be anything from reading to playing guitar to knitting, right? Um, gaining back hours in your week during this time can be utilized to sort of expand your interests, um, increase the challenges on your mind that weren't possible in your in the routine you were in previous, right? So a lot of options here. Um, and that was a brief checklist, but those are just some things that could just sort of change your line of thought. Um, maybe expand the way you're considering something, um, either for yourself or for your clients. So I just want to open up the floor one last time, make sure we have nothing else that we wanted to add, uh, and then we're going to say goodbye for today. All right, see you guys. See you next time.